Blessings, blessings, blessings. Uh, thank you for joining me today uh, in this discussion uh, on marriage. Uh, we're going to talk about a couple of things uh, related to marriage, and I think this is going to be a fruitful discussion. Uh, we want to uh, not necessarily talk about um, issues within the marriage per se, but we want to talk about some of the particulars of marriage, uh, namely, uh, we want to talk about um, those vows and, and, and what makes marriage official. We even want to talk about whether or not uh, what God's role is in, in, in two persons coming together, uh, getting married. And, and uh, we want to talk about, uh, of course, uh, business marriages and some of the things that uh, um, come up in our society today. So um, I am... Um, <laughs> God bless you, Greg, uh, Norman, uh, praise God, Adam, I see you, Monique, God bless you, uh, Miko, Keely, bless you. Uh, great topic tonight, yes indeed. Uh, Greg said that uh, <laughs> they're predestined. <laughs> oh man, so this is going to be a great topic tonight, and uh, uh, we, we are, uh, uh, many people are joining in, and I am grateful for your uh, participation. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and get started here in just a couple of minutes. Um, just a couple of minutes here and uh, we will uh, uh, get rolling here. So uh, thank you for joining me. Uh, so tonight or today rather I, and I missed uh, I, I do apologize I did miss uh, Monday's uh, broadcast. I was uh, traveling so I uh, did a seven-hour drive uh, from uh, Florida, Central Florida, all the way up to back home to Georgia. So uh, I was not able to do my regular time. Uh, so this is somewhat of a makeup. And um, some people ask, so, so, so where do you get uh, these topics from? Bless you, Pastor, uh, excuse me, Pastor Donovan, uh, Bishop Hendricks, uh, uh, Minister Sophia Singleton, bless you. Uh, so many people are asking, where do you get these topics from? And uh, I'm going to tell you, um, people ask me a lot of questions. And uh, in my inbox, there are quite a number of uh, persons who um, suggest certain topics. And uh, so, so I am never out of ideas. I promise you, uh, based on all of the questions that I get and the um, some of the discussions that I have in my inbox, there are quite a number of uh, things. To, there's, there's, just, there's just a lot of information, a lot of topics to, uh, to discuss. So, so let's get into it today. And uh, I've got my uh, notes here. Um, so let, let's talk about the first one. Does God select your spouse? Now, uh, this is going to hurt for a whole lot of people because uh, you hear this a lot. This is, a, you know, you can't go into any singles group. You can't go into any kind of meeting uh, where marriage is being discussed among Christians. And, uh, and they're not going to give you story after story about um, how God showed them who they, were, who they married, so forth and so on. Now, I'm not going to fight uh, with those people for, for that belief. I'm not going to... Uh, wrestle them down to the ground about what they uh, what they believe in that regard. I, I will go to the scripture though, and I want to point something out because again, if scripture is our final authority, uh, not subjective experience, not personal experience, not esoteric uh, 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 views and experiences, um, it, it's the scripture that tells us um, that informs us what what it is that we are to believe. Uh, and and why and everybody's had their own little uh, personal experience as to how they met who uh, who it is that they met and married or, or what have you uh, but I think there is a danger in the way that we spiritualize that process and I I personally believe that it has a lot more to do with why many Christian marriages are failing than many people would realize it, it's the way that we're approaching the topic of marriage and the way that we are spiritualizing the process 
leading into marriage, particularly as we're talking about uh, the dating process that has a lot to do with why people are marrying who they're marrying and why many of these marriages are turning out the way that they are turning out. So, so let's deal head on with the question of whether or not God selects um, who it is that you are going to marry. Now let me just be, and I'm going to be facetious, that's why you see that little grin on my face. Um, uh, I find it interesting uh, that those who, um, who reject election, uh, you know, God's sovereignty and election, <laughs> those who adamantly reject it, are, are some of the main proponents of this notion uh, that God was the one that picked my wife out or picked my husband out. In other words, they're saying God elected who it is that I was going to, to marry from the foundation of the earth. Uh, and so that always surprises me uh, how people believe in election uh, when it comes down to certain things, but when it comes down to salvation, uh, they, they, they don't believe that. And so that, I just wanted to throw that out there. I find that uh, hilarious. And so uh, let's look at Jesus' words. And Jesus takes these words from Genesis chapter 2. And my text is in Matthew chapter 19. And so the, the question comes to Jesus about marriage and divorce. We won't get into that. But I do want to look at Jesus' statement here in uh, Matthew uh, chapter 19. And so he says in verse 4, haven't you read uh, that he who created them in the beginning made them male and female? And he also said, for this reason, a man will leave his father and mother and be joined to his, to his wife and the two will become one flesh. So they are no longer two, but one flesh. Therefore, what God has joined together, man must not separate. Now, so I want to answer this question with Jesus's words. I want you to notice that Jesus does not say who God has joined together. Jesus says what God has joined together. So let me put it together using, using these pronouns or using, uh, using these words, who and what. Now, the first two who's that God created was Adam and Eve. In order for God to put the what together, which is the marriage institution, he had to personally join the first two who's. And now the first two who's were male and female, but they were not just male and female, they had identities. They were Adam and Eve. And so God joined the first two who's that were male and female, Adam and Eve together, in order to establish the what, which is the marriage institution. After God joined the first two who's together, who are male and female, particularly Adam and Eve, God did not need to put any other who's together because the marriage institution is predicated on a what. And the what is male and female. Now, who those what's are, are determined by you. You don't determine the institution. The institution has already been determined by God as to consisting of two what. That is a male and a female. But the who the male is and who the female is, is now determined by us. And, and, and whatever your cultural process is, whether it's your mom and dad who determines that, whether it's your brother who determines it, whether it's you who determines it, God has left that aspect up to the will of people. God is not the one putting two who's together. Jesus said what God has joined, and the what is the male and female through the first two who's. After God has established the uh, institution of marriage, it is designed to continue uh, on the basis of the criteria that God has established. So God has determined the what, 
of marriage. He does not determine the who of marriage. So, so now, there are, outside of Adam and Eve, there are only, there's only one other example of, of, of that in Scripture, and that is where God tells uh, Hosea to marry Gomer, the prostitute. And, and so not only is that a one-off from the way that God normally does things, uh, historically and contextually, the reason that God does that is so that he can use a three-dimensional parable to teach Israel about their own covenantal unfaithfulness to him. And so he then is like Hosea, going after the unfaithful woman, Gomer, even though they are violating, or she is violating, uh, the, the, the marriage covenant. And so the only reason that God does that is so that he can use that example as a three-dimensional parable to, to chastise Israel for their uh, spiritual adultery, their covenantal unfaithfulness. Apart from that, in the Jewish culture, persons were married because their parents typically, uh, even in the Eastern cultures, other Eastern cultures, their parents typically um, selected who it was that they were going to marry. Uh, you don't find uh, uh, Abraham uh, asking God, show me. Uh, give me a sign who, who, who I'm going to marry or give me a sign uh, as to who my son is to marry. He simply sends his servant out uh, to his uh, nation to find a wife for his, uh, for his son. And so he uses all of the uh, cultural practices of his day to determine uh, who his son was going to marry. It was not a spiritual practice, it was a cultural practice. And so throughout the scripture, uh, it was people who determined who the two what's were, or, to, or, or who the two who's were. And, and, and so who the male is and who the female is in marriage is determined by you. Uh, it is not determined by God. Now, uh, um, uh, so... Uh, there are people who say, well, uh, I know God was the one who, who, who led me to, to, to my husband or, 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 or led me uh, to my wife. And, and so in reality, what you are saying has more to do with fatalism than it does with the Bible. Uh, and fatalism is, is the idea that was very popular uh, in Greek mythologies where uh, the gods determined everything uh, that happened ahead of time, that everything was predetermined. Have you ever heard somebody say, well, I know that all things happen for a reason. Uh, uh, that's really not biblical. Uh, and I know we say that a lot, but and that's not what the Bible actually says. The Bible says that all things work together for the good of those who are called uh, according to uh, God's purpose, who love the Lord and are called according to his purpose. But the Bible doesn't say, uh, uh, I know everything happens for a reason. So that idea actually comes from fatalism. And that is the idea that every single act, every single thing that happens, good or bad, uh, is the result of some determination, some predetermination by the gods. And, and, and so the reality is, is, is that uh, uh, marriage is the result of the will of man. Now, now the marriage institution is the result of the will of God. And he put the what together by putting two specific who's together. After that, it is up to you to use your rational thinking, wisdom, and guidance to determine who that other who is going to be. And so, so, so imagine now part of the reason why there are so many, I believe, so many marriages in trouble uh, within Christianity is because you have so many people entering into marriage on the false premise that God is the one that's going to determine who it is that I'm going to marry. So once you, once you believe that, once you accept that premise, uh, it doesn't require now for you to do any real thinking on the matter. It doesn't 
require you to be uh, investigating. It doesn't require you. You can pretty much park your brain uh, in autopilot because if God is the one who's already made that choice, how could God make a bad choice? Now, I know how people can make bad choices, but how could God make a bad choice? So at the end of the day, if God is the one that selected your your spouse for you, uh, when things don't work out, the reality is, is that God could then be the one uh, who is to blame. Because how could God lead you to marry somebody uh, that, 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 and he knew ahead of time, uh, chose this person for you, and them knew this person would beat you upside your head. How could God be, how could God do that? And, and there are a lot of people, again, they don't realize the implications theologically of their statements. Uh, and, and so while yes, the word of God may give us, uh, guidelines, that is, uh, guidance or wisdom, that is not to the same thing as saying God is the one that selects who it is that we are going to marry. God does not violate uh, our will in, in that regard. We have to use wisdom and discretion. Now, uh, it, 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 it's funny, but we buy cars with more information than we go into marriages on. We select colleges for our children and for ourselves. We buy homes. Uh, being more informed than we go into uh, um, uh, marriage on. But as soon as it comes down to marriage, all of a sudden, we get mystical with it, and, and we go into this pie-in-the-sky kind of a deal. Uh, my husband's coming from God sending him. My wife is God sending her. Uh, this kind of a notion. Well, well, if we entered into marriage in the same way that oftentimes civil cases uh, are determined. They have this thing called a discovery. And, and so long before it goes to court, the discovery uh, uh, process is where the lawyer meets with the uh, parties in order to determine whether or not there is evidence or reason to take this into court. And so, so, so if Christians embraced a dating as a discovery process we would we would fare better and we would have marriages that would last longer because they would not be predicated on false ideas and premises that are that are that are more aligned with fatalism uh, uh, than they are with scripture and so in reality when 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 dating occurs we should be, uh, should we be having fun? Should we go out to dinner or bowling or the movies or whatever? Doesn't matter what you do. What, what does matter is, are you paying attention to whether or not there is evidence that would inform you that such a person uh, is the right kind of person for you? Now, if you have in your mind that God is the one that makes that decision, I'm telling you, then you are headed for uh, a brick wall right in front of you at 70 miles an hour. Because God, my brothers and sisters, does not make that decision. He expects you to make that decision. That's what rationality and, and, and reason is all about. It, this is not a spiritual process. I, it doesn't matter what your pastor told you or, or, or what kind of teaching you have received prior to that. Who you marry is not a spiritual process. It is an intellectual process. It is an emotional process. But you have to use reason and wisdom and guidance to enter into this process. But, but, but this false notion that God is the one that determines that is not biblical. It's not supported anywhere in the scripture. Again, the only two people that God actually put together was Adam and Eve. And he needed to do that in order to establish the what of marriage. He had to put the first two who's together. And then, of course, the only other reason was um, uh, Hosea and Gomer. And, 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 and we just explained again why God did that. And, and, and so we've got to, the sooner we depart, from that kind of idea, we are going to actually be better off equipping 
young men and young women or middle-aged men and middle-aged or whoever it is that's wanting to get married, we're going to be better off equipping them to approach the process because we are already letting them know ahead of time what their role and responsibility is in the process. But when you make it a, this is a God thing and this is what God does, then I don't have much responsibility to make that choice if I'm leaving it up to God to make that choice for me. And so do you see how that creates an opportunity, a setup for failure later down the road when the thing starts going south? And, and, and what are you going to do? You're going to say like Adam said, that woman, Lord, that you gave me, that man that you gave me. See, listen, God's not on the hook for your choice. You, you're on the hook. For your choice. And so that's where we've got to make more informed uh, choices about who it is that we marry. And we've got to uh, despiritualize the process so that we are not teaching people and we are not uh, perpetuating the myth that God is the one who determines who it is uh, that we are going to marry. So, so, so again, we've seen the text in Matthew uh, chapter 19, uh, verses 5 and 6. It says, what God has joined together. Not who, uh, but what God has joined together. Um, let's also talk about when is marriage official. Uh, because, uh, you know, there, there are those who say, well, you know, it's, it's official when you say the vow. And, and there are those who say, well, I disagree with that. I think it is official uh, when, um, when the marriage is consummated. Uh, and then there are those who say, well, I think it's, it, it, it's both uh, vow and, and consummation. And uh, so let's kind of talk about that uh, for a couple of minutes. And, and so first of all, let's talk about the idea of vow. Now, in our culture, vows are uh, very, very important. In the Jewish culture, they had what it was that was called a ketubah. But a ketubah was less like a vow and more like an actual covenant. And so let's establish, first of all, that a vow is, is, is the way that it works in our society uh, is less of a covenant in terms of the way that we we explain it. And, and so it doesn't have a lot of the same uh, features of a covenant. Now it is a covenant, uh, but it doesn't act like a covenant. So so let me let me help you with where I'm going. Let's say a person's marriage vow today, let's say two people stood at the courthouse or in a church and their vows went something like this. Uh, I promise to love you and to stick with you um, until the day that you gain 30 extra pounds, uh, or until the day that you can no longer perform sexually to my satisfaction. Now, has that person made a vow? They have, right? And, and, and so you would agree with that. But their vow is, is, is taking the marriage and predicating it upon the terms of the vow. So it is important for Christians to understand that the weight of marriage is not predicated on the meaning of the vow. If that were, then we can literally structure the vows to, to, to a sense of open-endedness so that there is a way out of it. And so it's important to know that the vow is not the strength of the marriage relationship. Because again, vows are basically, they, they only mean what they mean. And, and if the vow is contrary to the marriage itself, then it's no real marriage. It is a vow, but it's no real marriage. And so the meaning of marriage then is not predicated and it is not inextricably connected to the meaning of the vow because you can structure the vows to mean a lot of things that are contrary to what marriage is all about. And, and, and so marriage then is, is predicated on the idea of covenant, not vows, but covenant. Uh, covenant is more binding than vows. 
You understand what I'm saying? So, so that's important for us to understand. It's covenant. The other thing is, is according to Genesis chapter 2, the Bible says, and the two shall become one flesh. Now, this is a euphemism for uh, sexuality. This is a, uh, not sexuality, but the sexual experience uh, in marriage. This is a euphemism for that. And, and, and so the two becoming one flesh uh, is the physical expression of what the covenant is actually all about. And so if you don't have a physical coming together, it, it basically says that the covenant was a lie. So, so in many senses, sex is the parable that explains the covenant. And so if the covenant is not true, well then the, uh, the parable is actually explaining a lie. And if you don't have a parable, you actually don't even have a covenant. And so both of them are two different aspects of the very same thing. The covenant, the covenant explains the coming together where is, whereas the actual physical act of sexually coming together demonstrates that coming together. And, and so you have to have the covenant and you have to have the consummation. Now, uh, somebody will say, well, 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 well preacher, um, I know somebody, let's just use a hypothetical. I know somebody, uh, who just got married uh, and, um, they, uh, they've been married now for uh, three months and they have not consummated the marriage. The, the man uh, absolutely refuses to have sex with his wife or let's say the wife absolutely refuses to have sex with the, uh, uh, with the husband. What's going on there? Well, uh, what would I say? Now, now, I mean, now before... Uh, before we, we, we drive them down to the, to the courthouse, uh, let's, let's, let's try and figure out what's going on. Uh, first of all, now, um, it could be that the one who is saying that uh, has some deeper seated issues. Uh, so we've got to try and figure that out. Now, you know, you know is, is there some same-sex attraction going on that, that's, um, that's leading you down that road? The person says no. Okay, so then what about molestation? Were you ever, were, were you ever sexually molested uh, at, at a certain point in time? Because again, uh, that could make a person, that could turn a person off to sex. It could make them feel like this is, just, this is a violation of my body, this is terrible. Um, and so the person says, no, I, I was never sexually uh, molested at any time. Okay, do you have some long-standing porn addiction to where the actual physical act is not attractive? It's all about the mental thing for you. Is that what's going on? The person says, no, that, uh, that's not going on. Well, well, perhaps maybe there is a uh, biological issue, a chemical, the, 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 lack of the, the, the lack of hormones being produced in the, in the brain whereby uh, 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 the person could be sexually stimulated uh, because there's a fix for that. We, 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 you know, there's that blue pill. There's a number of things that you can do to fix that. Uh, it could be, again, a health issue. No, well, well that's not it. Well, we want to make sure we determine that. We want to get you to see a doctor, so forth and so on. Let's now say we have gone down our checklist and none of those things are the reason. It is not a health issue. It is not same-sex attraction. There is not a porn addiction. Uh, there is not an issue of molestation or anything like that. Um, biblically speaking, after all of those things have been determined, uh, it is a, you can make a biblical assumption that this is not a marriage at all. It is not a marriage at all. Part of coming together in a covenant requires consummation. It requires uh, that the covenant uh, be agreed upon and, and, and the act of sex, the coming together in, as one flesh is a physical expression of what the covenant states that it is. 
And so if you don't have that, and if there's no desire to do that, you do not have, marriage is not a platonic relationship. If you just want a buddy, a uh, 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 pen pal, or something like that, there are plenty of people that you can be inboxing uh, and DMing and all that other stuff on social media. Marriage is not a, a, a platonic relationship. It is a sexual relationship. And it is wrong for you to defraud your spouse. That is to, to make a promise when you have no intention on fulfilling that promise. And, and, and that's essentially what you are doing uh, when you uh, agree to marry somebody and then deny them uh, uh, the sexual um, the, 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 the pleasure of the sexual coming together. And, and so, so then we would say that both are important. <clears throat> Excuse me. Both are integral to uh, marriage. Uh, what about these business marriages there? Let, let's talk about that. Because if somebody said, well, well, well preacher, um, if a person doesn't have the right motive when they when they uh, uh, get married, let's say they they, they just want a, a business arrangement so that they could get their green card or whatever it is. Does that make marriage actually? Uh, does that invalidate that marriage? In other words, so now uh, we've got to go back to what we had dealt with before, uh, because again, the strength of marriage is not in the wording of the vows. Because if that we can word the vows to say things that are contrary to. The of marriage itself and and, and 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 so the reality is is that when a person when two persons enter into covenant agreement for marriage uh, whether both or one has impure motives none of that the motives don't invalidate uh, the reality of of the marriage now again if they if if if, if, if they never consummate and 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 they just walk through the motions at the courthouse, uh, that may be a legal marriage uh, from a civil standpoint, but it is really no marriage indeed. But let's say they do consummate, and it's a business arrangement. Uh, well, it has then all of the earmarks of an actual marriage. And, and, and so, so here's the best way that I could put it. Uh, it, it it's like with the, with, with, with the doctrine of election. There are those who protest and say, well, one of the reasons, preacher, that I can't believe uh, that God has elected some to salvation and not others is because that just makes it seem like God is, 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 is unjust uh, and, and, and that kind of a thing. Well, so here's the thing. Uh, is, is, is what people don't have to understand is, is that you've got to start with the idea and the concept of God's justice in order to, to go any further with the whole discussion. So it is in marriage. You have to start with the idea of the justness of God. And so the reality is, is, is that God was the one that established marriage, uh, not people. People didn't establish marriage. And, and so the, the facts are, is, is that marriage is what God has defined it to be. And so just like people who, let's say they are not elected, well, because God is just, they still have a responsibility to repent, whether they can or not. And the reason they have that responsibility is because God is just. Well, it is the very same thing with marriage. Even if a person's motive is not to actually be married, when you enter into covenant agreement, even if it is because of business, you still have an obligation to fulfill the, the covenantal responsibilities of marriage, even if your motive is wrong. And why? Because God is just. Because God is just. And so if a person has entered into to a business marriage, it doesn't necessarily mean that that's not a legitimate marriage. But it does mean that th these persons, for whatever their reasons are, uh, need to recognize that they still have a responsibility to that marriage to honor God because God is just. And so I would say that business marriages and those kind of arrangements, they cheapen the idea of marriage. They cheapen it 
because they make it just some sort of casual business relationship and, 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 and it cheapens the idea of what marriage is all about and why God has actually created it. But because it's cheapened in their practice and in their motive doesn't make it less marriage. And so I would warn those who have entered into such relationships that you are no less married than somebody else. And you have a responsibility to do what is right in that relationship because God is just. Again, even if Pharaoh's heart was hard, didn't matter. He still had a responsibility to repent whether he could or not. Why? Because God is just. And, and, and so, 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 so we've got to approach marriage not as some civil union. If you are a Christian and you are seeing marriage as a civil union, you do not have the biblical framework to understand marriage at this point. You have to see marriage as a construct of God. You have to see marriage uh, as an institution that God, that God planned and God implemented personally himself. And, 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 and so... Honoring marriage, then, is taking on God's uh, thinking about marriage uh, as it relates to that. So I would say, yes, uh, business marriages are wrong by motive, but that does not mean that they are any less married uh, than, than anybody else. And so they still have a responsibility uh, to, to do uh, what is right as it relates to um, the marriage institution. Uh, somebody said, well, what about reproduction in marriage? Because they, I know people, I know actual Christians uh, who believe uh, that um, the purpose of marriage is, is for reproduction. Uh, and maybe you know people uh, who believe that as well. They, they believe that the purpose of marriage is reproduction. And, they'll, and, and this even is part of the reason why they don't believe in, in, in um, uh, what do you call it, uh, uh, birth... Um, Birth prevention. Uh, what, what, what's the word? Uh, what's the word there? Um, I'm forgetting the word. Uh, nonetheless, uh, <laughs> contraceptives, things of that nature in order to uh, prevent birth. And so a lot of times they'll go to the Genesis text and say, hey, uh, God commanded that we should be fruitful uh, contraception and that we should be fruitful and multiply and replenish the earth. And, and, and so... Um, Certainly, uh, that is an aspect or a byproduct, birth control, thank you, uh, that is a, an aspect of marriage. Uh, but biblically speaking, uh, that is not the purpose of marriage, uh, and, and, and for several reasons. And, uh, and, and I want to go to uh, uh, Genesis uh, 2 uh, to point something out. Uh, so, so that can't be, it can't, it can't possibly be the purpose of marriage. So one of the reasons is, is that when we look in Genesis chapter 1, we can see in the creation that God made everything that he created, uh, whether it was uh, herbs or whether, uh, you know, plants or, or trees or fruit or everything, uh, it says to reproduce after its kind. And, and, and so, so that is how God created everything to, to, to have that ability to reproduce. But that doesn't say anything particularly about marriage. That says something about uh, creation, not necessarily about marriage. And, and if that were the purpose in marriage, it would not make God's creation of men and women any different than his creation of birds or plants or anything. But the only of God's creation that God put the imago Dei upon were people. And so that then takes our marriage and makes it something more special than just the normal reproductive purpose that God gave to all creation. And so marriage then is more than just reproduction. Uh, in, in, in fact, that is a by, it may be a byproduct of marriage, but it is not the purpose of marriage. Uh, I believe the purpose of marriage is found right here in uh, Genesis, uh, Genesis chapter uh, 2. Um, 
And it says here in verse 18, Then the Lord God said, uh, It is not good for the man to be alone. I will make a helper as his complement. Now, so you have to understand the backdrop at, at, at which God is saying this. Uh, he is not saying, I need to pair Adam up like I have done everything else. So that, that's not what God is saying. And, and, and so, as Adam is seeing, there are two tigers, uh, there are two elephants, there are two giraffes, there are two birds, uh, you know, there are two lizards. Uh, and, and, and this is not saying that God looked around and said, um, I need to make a pair for Adam here. Uh, in, in, that's not the sense in which God uh, is, is saying this. Uh, in fact, the Hebrew word levad uh, is... is uh, is the word to be alone in the Hebrew, uh, and and the idea is it's it's the idea of a branch without a tree, uh, is, is the notion. So it's 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 not simply in being, the idea here is not simply in being um, unpaired, but the the idea is in being connected to something that that elucidates your own purpose and meaning. So nobody would ever imagine a branch as having purpose apart from the tree that it is connected to. You would always imagine this branch as being connected to a tree that gives it its sense of purpose. So, so when God says it is not good for man to be alone, the Hebrew word levad, this is very similar to the same word that God uses in Genesis chapter 1 when he says um, it is good. When God creates something, he says it is good. That is, that is the word uh, tov or, or even tov meod. It's, it's very good. The idea of good is not abstract. The idea of good is functional. In other words, God is saying it's working. It's doing what I have created it to do. Only when God looks at man, he sees that there is an aspect of man that is not fully functional apart from a wife. And so he says, it is not good, Levad, for this man to be alone. In other words, this man is not fully functional. So God created a helper for this man. And the text tells us, I will make a helper as his complement. What is God looking at? God is looking at how to fully fulfill the function of this man's purpose. So, so the purpose in marriage is about complementing. It is about how each person, how each person uh, elucidates, draws out, and, 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 and it helps to exacerbate the purpose that God has in the life of your spouse. That is why you get married. It is not about uh, how you can join two incomes together and, and buy that house. Or, or how, you can, how you can team up and be a power couple like Jay-Z and Beyonce. Getting married is about how you can come together with a person who best complements your function and your purpose, how you can contribute to their purpose and how they can contribute to yours. That is the meaning here in this text. That is the purpose for coming together. And, 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 and so we've got to begin to look beyond just uh, uh, I, oh, I like you, uh, you know, because see all that stuff wears out. And there's a whole lot of things that they can do that can really make you not like them. As much as you like certain people, uh, watch until they do something that you don't like, and we'll see how much you like them after that. And, and so the reality is, is that marriage has got to go beyond just liking. To, to, to We've got to understand the purpose of God uh, in, in, in marriage here. Uh, and, and, and so I would say then, uh, that you know, according to uh, what we are what we are talking about, reproduction is is not 
Uh, that is a byproduct of it, but that is not the purpose uh, for marriage. There are a lot of people who get married and say, listen, how could a person, person determines that this person I think is right for me or you're right for me. They don't know at that point whether or not uh, they can even uh, reproduce or whether they can conceive. They have no idea. So, so if, if, if reproduction is the purpose for marriage, uh, uh, it, then it goes without saying as we carry that logic out to its furthest conclusion that two couples who can't reproduce are wrong for each other. And that would be asinine. That would be completely wrong. And, and, and so again, it's not every single person can reproduce. In fact, that commandment was not given to every human being. It was given to Adam and Eve, and then it was also given to Noah and, and Noah's sons and, and daughter-in-laws. But that commandment is not given to every human being. That is not a, uh, a requisite of marriage that you, you must reproduce. Now, most marriages, most people that get married do want to reproduce. But there are some people who get married a little later. Some people are on their second marriage. Uh, maybe a spouse died or maybe there was some divorce somewhere in their life or whatever. And they're already done having kids. They don't have to have kids in order for their marriage to be uh, legitimate. And, 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 and so we've got we've to abandon the kind of thinking that would suggest that uh, reproduction is the only thing that makes marriage legitimate. Uh, and, and, and so then we take that same kind of reasoning uh, into the, the discussion of same-sex marriage and we say, well, uh, the reason it's not legitimate is because two men can't reproduce and two women can't reproduce. Well, no, that's, that's again, that's not why it's illegitimate. And, and so we've got to, again, that's why we've got to uncover the biblical purpose of God in marriage in order to understand why same-sex uh, uh, couples or that kind of idea of marriage is not legitimately biblical uh, marriage. Uh, what else do we have here uh, on the um, topic of marriage? I've been asked quite a number of different things uh, about marriage. Um, what else do we have there? Um, I think that's it, unless you've got a, uh, a question of your own uh, as it relates to marriage. If you've already asked a question, uh, I probably missed it. So if you want to type it in uh, down at the bottom of the screen, I'll, 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 I'll do my best to, uh, to answer that question. Uh, but um, I think that pretty much kind of takes care of most of the uh, topics that I had planned to uh, discuss uh, today. Anybody else with any question as it relates to uh, marriage. Uh, feel free to, uh, thank you, Tyra. I appreciate it. And, uh, uh, anybody with any questions, uh, does God send or assign people for our life? So yeah, so that would go all the way back to the original, uh, question that we had. And since God doesn't send us particular who's, uh, God has already set up the particular what, um, and, and that is, is that, uh, you know, we have to determine who the who is. And, uh, and we've got to use uh, wisdom and, you know, we've got to use discretion. We've got to use uh, a number of different things, judgment, uh, in order to make that, that best uh, determination. And we've got the wisdom of scripture. We've got the wisdom of our elders, uh, you know, some of our parents or whatever. Uh, but uh, but it is to that end that we make that decision, not based on God told me to marry uh, him or her. Uh, that that just that's just not uh, biblically normative. That's not how God does it. He set up the what uh, we we determine uh, the who. Uh, uh, let's see here. Um, uh, uh, somebody is asking a question here. Uh, what about divorce and remarrying? Uh, great question, man. That is a topic unto itself. And uh, it is a very comprehensive topic. I wouldn't be able to answer that in, in less than a minute. Uh, but perhaps um, I will uh, consider doing a, uh, a Facebook Live on that discussion. Uh, that's almost one of those uh, um, uh, Topics that you, you've got half the room over here, half the room over there. That's like talking about tongues nowadays there. You, you get folks mad at you. Everybody's uh, uh, getting into a camp around that kind of thing. And uh, uh, 
I don't want to be the scapegoat for 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 that. Uh, but I do have um, uh, um, many hours of study uh, with regard to the subject of uh, divorce and remarriage uh, from a biblical standpoint. And perhaps at some point uh, I might do a Facebook uh, live uh, on that. Uh, I, I, I think that same question, Daryl, how many times can you get married still factors back into that whole discussion of... Uh, uh, divorce and and remarriage, and I know people will get into their camps immediately when everybody's standing up under their banner. They're either Judah or 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 Levi or something. When it comes down to that kind of thing, and 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 w whichever side the speaker is on, he's either heralded on the shoulders of one camp, or or uh, uh, you know threatening to be crucified by the other camp. So. <laughs> I uh, I do have intentions on writing a book. I'm actually working on a book uh, right now dealing with uh, the statements of Jesus on marriage and divorce uh, within its um, within its uh, Jewish context uh, in order to um, to to better make sense of many of those uh, statements. But I do agree, marriage as an institution uh, is under attack. It is under attack. And, and and again, I th and that's why I wanted to do this uh, Facebook Live because one of the one of the best ways to uh, now marriage as an institution does not stand or fall whether your marriage survives or not. Uh, however, I think one of the ways that we can uh, put some support around marriage is to reevaluate how we teach our approach to marriage, and Christianity has not done. And in the West, a very good job of teaching on the approach to marriage through dating. Because again, we've left it up to uh, arbitrary things like God's the one who decides. And, and looking for signs in the clouds and all kinds of other arbitrary things. I think part of the way to support and honor marriage is to reevaluate our discussion of the approach to marriage. How are we entering into it? How do we de how do we determine who is right for us? And by despiritualizing the process, I think we would be making a step in the right direction. If you understand um, what it is that I am saying, uh, somebody says, "Do I need to involve the courts in my marriage? Can I just use uh, a minister?" Sure, uh, but because you are in a civil society. The minister can marry you, but the the record of that marriage needs to be registered uh, by the laws of your civil society. So, 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 uh, yes, you 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 do need to involve the courts because of the society that you live in. Now, if you live in a society that doesn't require that, then then sure, whoever the officiant is, that is all that that would be necessary. But if your if the laws of your uh, uh, society um, demand that your marriage, that there is a record of your marriage, uh, then um, a civil record of your marriage, then 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 we we need to cooperate with that uh, in 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 that regard. But that doesn't necessarily make it marriage. It just means that that is the civil uh, aspect of uh, the, the the civil compliance of marriage, and uh, certainly that does not. Uh, fly in the face of, or is not contrary to anything that we we read in Scripture. So we should be uh, uh, we should we should be um, in agreement with that. Uh, anything else? Why should why should we pray when seeking a spouse, or should we even pray in that process for direction from God? Uh, Roshane, that is a great question. This is going to be the last question, uh, but but that is a great question. And so, again, having said that God is not the one that determines who it is that we're going to marry from a biblical standpoint, doesn't mean that we should not pray for wisdom. That's what we should be praying for. So, because the question is when you say, uh, how should we pray, uh, the idea is, is that, well, what are you praying about? Are you saying, Lord, show me who I'm going to marry? Well, if, you, if you're saying that, then you're asking amiss, because that prayer then is not predicated on the word of God. That prayer is predicated on an idea that does not align 
uh, with the message and meaning of Scripture. And, and so, sure, a person should be praying with regard to who it is that they're going to marry. But that prayer needs to be something like, Lord, give me wisdom. Uh, Lord, help me to be perceptive. Lord, help me to notice the things that I should notice. Lord, help me to not become so emotionally uh, involved that I am blinded by my emotions and, and, and that my reasoning uh, is, is, is not uh, where it should be. So we should be praying for, for wisdom, not for God to show us who it is that we should be marrying. Because again, that, that idea is just not supported in Scripture. So, the, so of course, by all means, pray. But, but if you're expecting God to show you whether or not he or she is the one, I'm telling you from a biblical standpoint, that prayer presupposes this notion that God is the one who picks out who it is that you're going to marry uh, uh, to begin with. And so then that prayer, just like that presupposition, is just not biblical. And so you should be praying, uh, praying for wisdom. See, when you become a Christian, God does not expect us, he does not expect us to put our, uh, our, our brains on autopilot. And, and when you go to church, certainly don't park your brain at the door. Um, uh, God does not take over the wheel uh, of, of, of your uh, intellectual capacity uh, either. So that's why God gave it to us. And so we've got to use it in ways that do glorify and honor God. Uh, but when we spiritualize the process and we want to sit our own thinking aside and say that God is going to uh, do it, then we are putting God on the line for something that God has not signed up for. Uh, to, to say the least. And, and that is the point um, uh, 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 that, that I am making there. Uh, uh, there you go. And, and so one brother said the Lord is involved when the word is used as our standard. That is exactly right. So it doesn't mean that God is not involved uh, in the process. But the degree to which God is involved needs to be qualified so that it is clear that we are not saying that God is the one who determines. Now, I know there's a hundred people who are going to be saying, well, that, that's not how God did it for me and my husband. Well, again, uh, if, if you are okay with making personal examples and subjective experience, the authority on the, or the basis upon which you determine what it is that you will believe, uh, then, then, you know, I, I, I can't say much to that. I can only say that uh, when we are Bible believers, that means that we must be committed to the final authority, not arbitrary uh, uh, examples, but the final authority of what Scripture does teach us. And that is the standard uh, by which we, we base uh, uh, um, what it is that we believe. Um, I'm going to just tackle this last one. I have to because Philip brought up such a great question, and that is, is shacking considered uh, a marriage. So many people who are living this lifestyle uh, believe uh, that they that they are, and and so um, in many societies, after they have shacked up for X amount of years, uh, they kind of grandfather them into the marriage, uh, and they call it common law marriage, and um, and in some societies uh, they do that. Um, well, as Bible believers. Um, we're not taking our cues from from society as it relates to uh, to marriage. We're taking our cues from from what the Word of God says, and uh, I do not see the practice of shacking as being particularly God honoring. For this reason, again, shacking can be done without a covenant, and 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 so so the easiest thing at that point when there is no covenant. Uh, is to abandon because there is no covenant. But when there isn't a covenant, when there is a covenant, when there exists a covenant uh, that 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 explains the basis for the relationship, uh, abandonment is not an attractive option uh, because the relationship has meaning because it has been uh, it has been defined clearly on the basis of something that's foundational, something that's bedrock. But living together establishes nothing other than we're just living together. That's it. And, and, and so marriage teaches us 
that in fact if living together was 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 the best thing that there could be there would be no need for marriage because again what would how do you define marriage uh uh, uh you know and 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 see that's what we got to realize is that the the goal of the homosexual community uh is not to uh to create marriage equality the goal of the homosexual movement uh is to eradicate marriage altogether. See, once you open up the definition of marriage, what you end up having is not new definitions of marriage, but no marriage at all. Because where does it stop? Let's carry it out to its logical conclusion. Well, if, if, if we open the definition of marriage up to include something more than a man and a woman, and now it's two men, and now it's two women, so at what point does it not become the man and his truck? At what point does it not become the woman and, and, and her cat? At, at what point does it not become uh, a, a grown man and a three-year-old uh, 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 toddler? At, at what point does it not become uh, anything that you... And so if you can make it anything that you want to make it, then it has no definition. And as a consequence, it has no meaning. And so it is the covenant then that we need to uh, we need to be to be paying particular attention to. And so shacking up fails to meet the covenantal criteria. It hasn't said anything. That's the problem with shacking up. It's not. It, it it's what it has not said. It has not said anything. It has not said anything in regard to the relationship and why people would want to be in a quasi relationship that has not put any definition any parameters around it uh is is completely asinine to me that you will take uh 15 or 20 or 30 years uh of your life uh and 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 and, and you know the and, and 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 give it to somebody that won't define what it is that you have uh, you know, and again, you know, boyfriend and girlfriend going together. No, well, that fails to, that falls short too. That, that falls short too. So, 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 so that is what makes marriage so high, uh, in, 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 in our thinking and in our practice. That's what elevates it above all kinds of other romantic type relationships, uh, as, as people, uh, would, uh, would suggest. So, uh, there it is, my friends. Uh, I think that is uh, that is my time, and I pray that you would share this video, of course, with uh, with somebody maybe they're considering marriage. I think that first part, especially of the video, uh, would be particularly helpful uh, uh, to them. And uh, I I, uh, I pray that uh, you're blessed by it. Again, please share it, uh, and um, and in all you do, um, read the Word of God, study the Word of God and stand upon the word of God. It is our final authority for all things that we believe and practice. God bless you in Jesus' name.